uh, Dr. Ndwiga, Alex, and uh, good evening to our doula, Carol. So great to have every one of us here this evening to learn. And um, I think I would, I would want to start with a word of prayer but uh, we continue. Okay, so let's pray. Lord, we come before your glorious presence this evening, my Father, with thanksgiving, oh God, thanking you for your love, for your mercies, and even for your faithfulness, oh God. Thanking you for allowing us, Lord, even to meet here this evening, my Father, to learn, Almighty Father, oh God, because we, we are looking forward, Lord, even to learn in regard to matters of breastfeeding, oh God, so that we learn how to do it better, my Father. And even those that are, are, are expecting children, those that are already mothers, my Father, oh God, that shall be transformative and impactful in our lives, oh God. We pray for your presence throughout the meeting, my Father. We pray for a successful meeting, oh God. We thank you for the electricity. We thank you for internet, almighty Father, oh God. And we thank you, Father, for giving us understanding, for we have the mind of Christ, almighty Father, and that which we learn, my Father, is beneficial in our lives, oh God. We give you honor and we give you glory. Even for those that are yet to join us, we thank you, Lord, that they'll soon join us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, uh, welcome you uh, today for our webinar. On behalf of our pastors, uh, Victory Faith Church, on behalf of the Roundtable Group, on behalf of the Family Mountain, we welcome you to today's webinar on breastfeeding. So have you recently had a child or are you soon expecting a child? Have you attempted breastfeeding before and maybe it didn't go as you expected? Well, you'd like to know how to do it well next time. So today then is your opportunity and we invite you for today's webinar, where we have Mrs. Caroline Welime, who is a professional midwife. You'll get a better introduction in a short while. She's a professional midwife, she's a doula, and she's a breastfeeding expert. And she's going to share great and informative insight on why breastfeeding, what to expect during breastfeeding, and what do you do should you encounter challenges. So uh, just, uh, in a second, I'll share the ground rules so that we have a very successful meeting. So one is kindly have your audio and your video off, not unless you are um, maybe talking, just have your audio and video off. And then in regard to the questions, I highly encourage you to be very active uh, on the chat to ask as many questions as you can because that is how we learn. However, for our questions, so that it is more organized and uh, more efficient, Kindly just type in your questions on the chat. We'll be able to summarize them, and uh, Mrs. Caroline Weli will be able to assist us in answering those questions. So feel very welcome for today's webinar, and I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Ndwiga, who uh, will take over, and he's going to welcome Mrs. Caroline Weli. Good evening, all. I'm really glad to see the numbers of the participants increasing. I'm grateful to God for this day. Uh, uh, I am a participant in lactation. I may not be the main participant, but I am a major uh, support, and I thank God for that. Uh, so I'm grateful to God for this chance, and I'm grateful that all of us have gathered together to listen to Lady Caro. Uh, Lady Caro has been a friend right now. I'm actually calculating and seeing for 32 years. When I say that, actually, I'm actually beginning to feel old, <laughs> but I've known her for 32 years, and she's been such a blessing to me. Her and husband, John, are dear, dear friends. They were actually our best couple in our marriage. But more than that, Lady Caro is professionally a LAMA certified childbirth educator, a lactation certified educator, registered midwife with many years experience in the field, in the clinics. And now, right now, she's run, actually running a successful private practice in the town of Kitale. So I won't take much more time, but I'm going to welcome Lady Caro. We are all ears. We are lending you our ears. Caro, we are hearing, not just to hear but hear and obey the wisdom of God that comes through you so that we may be more successful and we may enjoy more this phase of life at which we are actually the primary source of nutrition for our children. Lady Caro, uh, the ground is yours. Okay. Uh... Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Caroline. 
Thank you, Ndwiga, for that introduction. I didn't realize we've known each other for that long. Um, as you've heard, I'm um, a midwife, uh, a Lamaz certified educator, both for childbirth and for lactation. But in addition to that, I'm also a mom. So I've done some breastfeeding. Um, on top of sharing information, we also share experiences to make this experience less stressful, and hopefully we will achieve everything that God designed for us to achieve as humans when he put breastfeeding as part of parenting and taking care of our, our newborns and young ones. So I'll just go straight ahead to the presentation today. Um, I want to share my screen so that I can put this... Uh, video. Uh -huh. Okay, so as you have been told, uh, today's meeting is basically going to be we are going to discuss why breastfeeding. And uh, this is going to be my big portion of today's presentation. Uh, hopefully, I will get some people with the same conviction like I have. Um, it's very difficult for people like me to easily suggest there are alternatives. You can buy formula, you can use cow milk, and I'm sure you've met some people out there who are like us. If you interact with lactation consultants, midwives who've done breastfeeding and are passionate about breast milk, breast milk is the thing for newborn babies and infants. And so I'll take uh, a good portion of today's presentation to try and bring some understanding to why that is so. And then uh, the next objective for this presentation is what to expect when you're breastfeeding. This section, I'll just show you a short video because I know it will capture most of what I want to say this and then it has good animations. So I think that will work better for that. And then we'll finish with challenges, what to do about them, and then we'll do the Q&A for any questions that might arise. So that will form um, what we're going to do today. So I'll, I'll, I'll right away go to why breastfeed. And when I was looking for nice pictures, Can people see my screen? No. Nope. You can't. Not yet, Lady Karen. Yeah, you know it's uh, it's telling me host host disabled, disabled participants screen sharing. Is it possible for her to share? Alex. Yes, I'm quickly taking a profile. Then I will open up and be able to share. Yeah. Maybe can you go ahead while I work on uh, uh, sharing? Yeah. Yes. Fine. Fine. Let me just go ahead. Uh, then we'll see the screen when we can. So why breastfeed? It, it's a question I have met. Uh, I've had moms ask. I've had dads ask. Why? Why can't I just get an alternative? The baby is hungry and all the baby needs is food. Anything else can do for breast milk. And usually my answer is no. Nothing takes the place of breast milk. Anything else is actually inferior to breast milk. So we, the first reason that I had put there, I had this picture, I really wanted you to see, but it's okay. The reason why we breastfeed and uh, breastfeeding means we are giving our children human milk is because human milk is very species specific. 
when God made milk, every animal's milk is very different depending on the need that that animal has. So like, for example, scientists have been looking into the composition of milk and a cow's milk is very different from a goat's milk, very different from a camel's milk, very different from a dog's meat, etc. Every milk is different and it's usually species specific. It targets and meets very specific needs and goals for a particular species. And so human milk was specifically designed for human babies. And the composition of that milk tells us quite a bit. So as much is being studied into the composition of milk, that's why you see organizations like WHO saying you exclusively breastfeed for six months. That has come out of the study of what really makes human milk in comparisons to other milk. So what do human babies really need? And infants during the first year of life. So I had put my first bullet there as human newborns and infants just need to survive. And I will explain what I mean by that. They need to survive. They need to, to make a smooth transition and survive in this world. And my second reason there, the needs of a human newborn and baby is, this is just something that came into my head when I was preparing this presentation. Humans were created by God to have dominion. You know, I was uh, looking at why do human beings have a bigger brain compared to other animals? You know, if you look at our body sizes, our brains are big. So humans have a big brain. And in just thinking about it, I saw what evolutionists say, their explanations to why humans have a bigger brain compared to other animals. And I just got this thing in my heart. Humans have a big brain because we were created to have dominion over all animals and to manage and run this earth. And that's another reason why it's important for our newborns to start off with human meat. It, it starts us off very well, and I'll show, you, show that to you in a short while. And of course, the last and obvious reason is because it is perfectly balanced to meet every growing developmental needs of our newborns and infants. So, survival. You know, when babies are born into this earth, they come from their mother's womb. That is a completely different world. In the womb, there is no bacteria, there is no fungi. I know sometimes it comes and gets to the baby, but they come from a sterile world. There are no germs that cause diseases. There's no inflammation. It, it's a perfect place where they're carried for nine months. Now, as they are getting born, they come to this other side. Our world is full of germs that cause diseases, bacteria, fungi, and yet we get a sterile baby who is supposed to make it in this world. And human milk has been designed such that everything in this transition is taken care of. When babies are first born, the first milk that they get is called colostrum. Colostrum is a yellowish liquid. It's not very much. It's actually, this, it starts forming in pregnancy. And that's the first milk. Now, people call colostrum nature's vaccine because it's full of immune components that protect against infection and inflammation. It's literally a vaccine. And then when babies come into this world, I know you've heard a lot about the immune system during this coronavirus season. Depending on your immune system, you will make it. Now, when babies are born, their immune system are one, immature, and two, they are novice and it educated in which is the good bacteria, which is the bad bacteria. And therefore, the good bacteria, some, some components that are already there in milk and the baby interacts with the mother, now introduce and educate a baby's immune system to how to handle bad bacteria, good bacteria, protect this human being from diseases. And a very good start to that is colostrum. And then as you give colostrum and as the baby interacts with the mother, we get the baby's body filled or colonized is the word they use with good bacteria. It first starts with the baby as the baby passes through the birth canal. There's a lot of good bacteria there that rubs on the baby's skin. Some goes into the baby's mouth 
and that forms the beginning of this good bacteria colonization. And we continue that process when the baby latches on the mother's breast. So this good bacteria now colonize and fill the baby's gut. And this is integral in how strong that immune system will be to protect the baby from infections and inflammation in this life on earth. So we have colostrum for the first three days, a very good thing that children should have to the maximum. After three days, this milk then changes to what we call transitional milk. Transitional milk is somewhere between colostrum and mature milk. And this basically just supports the nutritional and developmental needs of the baby. The baby is growing rapidly. And so this transitional milk takes care of that rapid growth. From four weeks to six weeks, then the milk becomes mature. And this is what we will have for the entire period of the lactation. Mature milk varies in composition over the course of lactation. And it's uniquely individualized. That is another strength that human milk has. You see, like when we make other milks, we try and make the same thing that is good for everyone. But human milk is very specific. Depending on your needs, your baby's need, your body will make very specific milk. If your baby was born premature, the body will make premature milk specifically for that baby. It might not exactly be the same for another premature baby. Because the body understands where this baby has come from, the body can figure out the needs and then it makes milk that is specific to that baby. So human milk is very, it's uniquely individualized. Like if a mother goes to a different environment, the milk will provide antibodies to protect the baby from germs that are in that environment, which may not be the case for baby in another environment. So this human milk is uniquely individualized. It's not the same for all children. And then of course, as we will see later, it has something that we call whole milk and hind milk, and we'll discuss why that's important. Um, so I have a slide here that I wanted you to see the composition of milk from different types of animals. Just a visual that will help us see how different this milk composition is. I'm wondering, have we been able to, to yes. get me? Yes. Sorry? No. Sorry? You can. Say now you can. Now I can share? Yes. Um, Okay, let me share this screen. I really wanted you to see this. Then I share. You can see my screen. I have shared the screen. Not, not yet. Okay, share. Yes. And now, now you can see. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is the composition of milk. And uh, the table gives us uh, human milk is the first one on that list. Then we have a horse's milk, a cow's milk, a buffalo's milk, a goat's milk, and a sheep's milk. Now I know we commonly use cow, goat, and sheep. Just look at the protein and see how different it is. Then usually this protein is divided into something we call casein protein and whey protein. Look at human milk in comparison with this other milk. And then it gives you fat. I'll talk about the fat later on and then carbohydrates. You can see there are huge differences between human milk and these other milks. Now, this is the, the function of the human protein. So it provides amino acid that is necessary in building the physical body of the baby. But I want to spend some time talking about brain development and why that's very important. It's one of the reasons why human milk. And then, of course, uh, about promoting, um, making the immune system strong, that is also in there. And then it also serves as a prebiotic. It helps your body make or have the good bacteria that you need for survival. But I want us to have a look at this. Now we are comparing. Now we have casein protein and we have whey protein. If you look the animal table, you will notice that their protein is a lot. And if you were to see a division, usually animals have a higher percentage of casein. You can see from this table. They have a higher percentage of casein 
uh, and uh, a lower percentage of whey. But in human milk, we have more of whey than more of casein. Why is that so? So this, this brings in the, um, the differences very well in terms of a table. So you can see the, the blue is the cow's milk and then the green is the human milk. See the difference between casein and whey ratios. This is the proteins that you have in milk. Cow has just whey up there compared to human milk. So there's a difference. When you're giving human milk and you're giving cow's milk to your baby, it is not the same thing. Now, whey is easily digestible. Casein is not as easily digested. Now, the function of casein, casein helps the body grow in size. So the focus of casein is size. It makes this, the animal grow in size. Whey, on the other hand, focuses more on growing the brain. Uh, animals have a need to grow physically very rapidly. Like when a cow is born, in 40 days, a cow has doubled its birth weight. They increase in size very fast. Because for them, for their survival, they need the size and the stamina physically. But for human beings, apparently, we need to grow our brain fast. And so the physical development follows the brain. The brain is the primary development for our babies. And that's why we have the differences in casein and whey, proteins in milk. Um, so this just to show you some of the, the differences. You see like in colostrum, casein is just 10. That is the ratio, 90 to 10. In mature milk, it's 40 to 60. And this is the formula that uh, formula milks try to mimic. They try to make and put casein at 40 and weigh at 60 to make formula. But see in mature milk, in cow's milk, casein is 80 and whey is 20. So you see this difference. Cow's milk has a lot of casein. This is the linkage between, you see sometimes when children use formula milk, they grow in size. The overweight, this is where the overweight comes from because that milk has more casein than it has whey. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, for human beings. The priority is to grow the brain. The human brain grows very rapidly, you can see in the graph, from the time a baby is born. During the first few months, there is rapid growth of the brain. And this growth requires whey protein to grow. We, we actually complete much of the brain development by the time we are two years. I have a, a, a picture here I want to show you of the brain development in children. The brain grows at 1.7 grams a day. This is in the first year of life. By the time a child is two years, 75% of the adult weight has already developed. So as human beings, much of the brain develops in those early years. We have very little left for the age after two years. And this brain development is primarily reliant on whey protein, and that is why human milk has a lot of it. So you see things like children who are breastfed, they are more intelligent, their cognition is better, they develop language better. That is where this comes from. The brain also needs fat to grow. And um, I want to show you the difference between cow's milk and human milk. You can also see the differences in fat. Now cow's milk has a lot of saturated fats which the brain does not need. Human brains need these unsaturated fats to grow. And that's the reason why you see in human milk, we have a lot of those unsaturated fats. You see this imbalance between saturated and unsaturated fats is what contributes to the unsuitability of cow's, cow milk for humans. And saturated fat is what we need for brain development. In humans, the brain develops rapidly. And because the brain develops rapidly, we need unsaturated fat, especially during the first year of life. 
So you see, the, the, the need for animals is more the physical, the need for humans is more the brain, and we need unsaturated fats, and we need whey protein, and it's correctly balanced in human milk. So in addition to this, the fat that we need, we also need the omega-6 and the omega-3 fatty acids. We need the correct ones in the right proportions in human milk to support this growth. So now if I go back to this slide that maybe you didn't see when I started, uh, I divided my needs for a newborn baby as survive. This basically comes from uh, a thriving, vibrant immune system. We need that because we have a lot of germs that cause diseases here on Earth. And then to have dominion, really, humans need to be intelligent, and that's why they have bigger brains. And God gave us a lot of whey and unsaturated fat, which you cannot find in any other milk composition except in human milk. And then the rest of the things will help us in human development. Okay. Um, So I, I, I just found these images. I was actually looking for, these are MRI brain images for three-year-old children. This is the same age. Look at how a normal brain looks and extreme neglected. I, I really wished I would have found one for a child who's been exclusively breastfed and a child who's been formula fed and a child who has had mixed so that you can see the differences in the brain development. And brain development is one of the biggest results. And then the immune system is the other reason why we insist on human milk, because the requirements to meet the species of the human being has been correctly balanced in human milk. Now, these are other benefits of uh, why we breastfeed. Now, when babies are born, their guts, uh, their digestive systems are like porous, and so colostrum goes in and seals the spaces, making the digestive system more resilient. And then it also prepares the digestive system to digest the milk when we get there. And so it makes the, the digestive system more resilient, digests milk very well. And that's why it comes before we reach the mature milk. Now, we cannot use cow colostrum. You know, if you don't breastfeed, your baby will miss out on colostrum completely. And this, uh, the milk also promotes intestinal maturation and repair. Of course, it's perfectly balanced. And there's a lot of bonding and relaxation that goes on during breastfeeding because when the mother breastfeeds, the brain releases specific sets of hormones that relax the mother, relax the baby. Those people who breastfed, you'll just see. Like, if you get a baby who is apprehensive, crying, not feeling safe, Sometimes all it takes is putting them on the breast. They may not necessarily be hungry and they'll just relax and sleep. That is because of the hormones that get released by the brain when the baby starts breastfeeding. It releases a lot of relaxing hormones, a lot of happy hormones, and really promotes bonding and relaxation between the mother and the baby. Uh, when, when women breastfeed, this hormone called prolactin is the one that makes milk and it actually suppresses ovulation. And it's for that reason that some people think when they're breastfeeding, they can't get pregnant. Of course, it's not 100% protection, but it does play a role. And prolactin is only released when the baby is actually sucking on you. So when the baby latches on the nipple and starts sucking, then the level of prolactin increases in your bloodstream. As the levels increases, then ovulation is suppressed. And women who breastfeed exclusively will tell you just because they're breastfeeding, it takes longer before their periods resume after delivery. Then, of course, uh, it's excellent for weight loss. I remember with my first baby, I lost 10 kilos in one week with doing nothing, just breastfeeding. So it's, it's one thing. You see the weight that you're putting on during pregnancy? I tell women it's nature's reserve for breastfeeding. As you exclusively breastfeed, you just lose weight. And I'm sure we've seen animals, like we see animals with young ones, they lose weight. And that's another advantage of breastfeeding to the mother. And of course, the usual one, it's readily available, it's affordable. It's like God made the playing field level so that all human beings will attain this big brain, a strong immune system, because that is very necessary 
for life here on earth. And so I, I'm hoping by the time we are finishing with this, you are convinced. We, we, we can use formula milk, but formula milk for me is like buy and buy. Yeah, buy and buy. There's nothing we can do. I know breastfeeding is not easy. It's challenging. Moms have difficulties. Um, for me, I would rather we work through those difficulties, find a way of overcoming them and ensure that the baby still gets the milk because nothing really comes close to your own milk for your baby. So let's, let's encourage moms to breastfeed. It may be difficult, but breastfeeding really is the way to go. Um, I don't know how much, how much time we have. You wanted us to take a break. Because this is going to take another 15 minutes. Can we do before the break? So is this Alex? Carol, you can proceed. I can proceed for another 15 minutes before we take a break. Yes, you can. OK. So, so for this segment, uh, what to expect is really nice. It's nice to be prepared on what to expect. And I thought the best way to do this is just to show you a small video, a breastfeeding video. It will just take like 15 minutes like so. And then I'll come and wrap up with the challenges that we have during breastfeeding and how to handle them. And then we'll have a Q&A session after that. So just a moment, I, I, I play this video. Where is it? This is not Congratulations on your choice to breastfeed. It's a wonderful feeling to be able to nourish your baby. But for a new mom, pulling it all together isn't always easy. Learning the basics of breastfeeding can help. This program will guide you as you begin your breastfeeding journey, one step at a time.
breastfeeding within the first hour after birth is best for both baby and mom. Breastfeeding soon after delivery helps boost the baby's immune system, helps the mother's uterus to contract, and gives the newborn a chance to breastfeed and bond with her mother during the alert period after birth. Moms should tell the hospital staff that they will be breastfeeding so their babies aren't given any bottles of formula or water. If a newborn is given a bottle, they should still be able to adapt to breastfeeding. When newborns feed for the first time, they get a special milk called colostrum. This clear, yellowish, nutritious milk is exactly what babies need for their first meal. Colostrum is easily digested by newborns' delicate systems and is packed full of antibodies that protect them from sickness. A mother starts making this special milk during pregnancy and continues to make it for a few days after her baby is born. It then changes into mature breast milk. The best way to determine if your baby is ready to feed is by watching for his hunger signals. You won't want to wait until he cries to feed because crying is actually the last sign of hunger. He will give many other signals long before he resorts to crying. When a baby is hungry and ready to feed, she may open her mouth and bring her hand towards it. Or she may open her mouth when someone touches her lips lightly. She may also make a sucking motion with her mouth and tongue, turn her head toward the breast, make small body movements or sounds, and finally start to cry. A breastfeeding mother may also recognize the full feeling in her breasts as a sign that it's time to feed. A proper latch-on at the breast is essential for successful breastfeeding. A correct latch-on prevents nipple soreness and helps milk flow easily to the baby. Many hospitals have lactation consultants or other staff members who help new moms learn about latching on. You want to turn him on his side, facing your tummy, with his mouth right in front of your nipple, just like that. And that underarm is under your breast, just like it is. Then you're going to have thumb on top of your breast and fingers underneath with your hand off of the brown part or the areola. And then the third step is touching his lower lip with your nipple till he opens wide. And then when he opens, with your arm, you pull him in close. And there. This animation shows a baby correctly latching onto the breast. You can see how he opens his mouth wide as he is pulled in close to the breast so he can take in the areola, which is the brown or pinkish area around the nipple. When a baby is latched on properly, at least an inch of the areola and all of the nipple is drawn far back inside the mouth. The baby's tongue is under the nipple and slides forward over the lower lip. Once the baby has a good latch on, there will first be a short period of quick sucking to get the milk flowing. Then rhythmic sucking will begin with regular swallowing. The tongue acts in a wave motion, moving the milk through the nipple. You can tell that this baby is actively nursing because he has a good latch on, is alert, and you can hear him swallow after every two or three sucks. Listening for swallowing helps you know your baby is actually getting milk. This shows a baby latching on improperly to the breast. You can see that his mouth does not open wide to take in enough of the areola. As a result, the nipple is not back far enough in the baby's mouth, and his tongue is not completely underneath the nipple or far enough forward over the lower lip. This sort of incorrect latch on can cause sore nipples and may prevent the baby from getting enough milk. If your baby doesn't latch on correctly, gently take him off and try again. One way to do this is to insert a clean finger in the corner of his mouth to break the suction and gently pull your breast away. Finding a comfortable position is also a key part of a positive breastfeeding experience. Using pillows to support your arms or a stool to support your legs may help you feel more comfortable. There are a number of different breastfeeding positions. The following three are especially popular. The cradle hold, where the baby's head rests in the crook of her mother's arm. The lying down position, where mother and baby lie down on their sides, facing each other. And the football or clutch hold, 
where the baby faces the breast with his body tucked on your mom's arm at her side. No matter what breastfeeding position you choose, make sure that you're bringing the baby to the breast and not straining to bring your breast to your baby. Also, have your baby facing the breast and pull in closely. Engorgement and sore nipples can cause discomfort for some new moms in the first few days after birth. However, these are temporary problems, and once moms get through them, breastfeeding will be more comfortable. The main way to relieve engorgement is to empty the breasts by feeding frequently or pumping. During feedings, make sure the baby nurses long enough to soften the breast. Getting a good latch on and listening for his swallowing pattern will help you know that he's getting plenty of milk to empty the breast. Sore nipples are usually due to improper positioning. To help with sore nipples, make sure your baby is latched on correctly. Do not use creams, lotions, or soaps as they can cause further irritation. However, you may apply medical grade pure lanolin to relieve soreness and dryness between feedings. Breast shells can help keep sore nipples away from any abrasive clothing. If common problems such as engorgement and soreness don't go away quickly, call your health care provider, a lactation consultant, or breastfeeding support agency for help. Breastfeeding problems are usually easy to solve, so don't give up. Although new parents are urged to watch for hunger signals instead of scheduling feedings, there are some general guidelines to follow. Since breast milk is digested quickly, newborns need to feed about every one and a half to three hours, which means at least eight times in 24 hours. Remember, babies' feeding patterns vary, so some days they may want to nurse frequently, even every 45 minutes or so, while on other days it might be less often. Newborns also need to feed at least once at night, and young babies growing at an amazing rate and needs the extra nourishment provided by a night feeding. Also, if a new mother goes four or more hours without nursing, her breasts may feel uncomfortably full, and she may need to breastfeed to get relief. <laughs> This image shows the inside of the breast. Breast milk is made in the milk-making glands. The milk travels from these glands to the nipple through a series of ducts. You can see how milk pools in these ducts between feedings, ready for the baby to latch on and feed. There is a cycle that tells the milk-making glands when to make milk. First, the mom feels the baby suck. Second, a message is sent to the mom's brain to tell the breasts to make milk. Third, the breasts get the message and produce milk. Consequently, the more a mother breast feeds, the more milk she'll produce. Some mothers feel a sensation as their milk starts flowing to the baby. Moms may experience a menstrual cramp feeling, a pins and needles tingling feeling, or they may not notice anything. It is not necessary to switch breasts halfway through a feeding. In the beginning of each feeding, babies get four milk, which is full of nutrients and looks thin because it contains more water to satisfy thirst. As the baby feeds, this gradually changes to hind milk, which is richer. Hind milk is higher in calories, which are important for weight gain and satisfying hunger. It is important for babies to completely finish the first breast at each feeding, so they get all of the richer hind milk. So if a baby finishes one breast, she may feel completely satisfied and not want to take the second breast. But in the beginning, it is helpful to regularly use both breasts at each feeding to keep up a good milk supply and to relieve fullness. Because babies need this hind milk, newborns breastfeed for about 20 to 40 minutes at a time. As babies get older, they usually feed for shorter periods. The use of pacifiers and artificial nipples should be avoided in the early weeks. Several research studies have suggested that pacifier use has been associated with slow weight gain, nipple confusion, ear infections, and early weaning. Most importantly, a pacifier shouldn't be used to delay or replace a feeding. It's best for your baby to learn the sucking motion from your own breast, and a pacifier can't give your baby the comfort and security of being held close to your breast. If breastfed babies must be given bottles, either of breast milk or supplemental formula, 
They can usually adapt and continue to breastfeed without any problems. However, bottles should not be introduced until breastfeeding is well established. What do I do that way? I know this. Is there a sound? Okay. Um, someone stop it for me. Yeah, I want to stop it there. I want to stop it there. We can uh, do the remaining after I just highlight some some things from the video that I want us to highlight, then I will continue with what is left after the break. Is that okay? That is okay, Carol. We, we can stop as soon as you're ready. Yeah, so I just wanted to highlight uh, a few things uh, from the video. Uh, some challenges that we normally have, especially for babies born in hospital, is uh, breastfeeding within the first hour of life. That is very important. It starts you off very well. They call the first hour after delivery the golden hour because there's some very important hormones that peak in the blood and they only last for one hour. And that just gives you like a very good start for breastfeeding. Babies who are breastfed within the first hour of life one, mother's milk comes in faster. The longer it takes for the baby to be latched on, the mother will stay for longer before the milk actually comes in. And you know, waiting for your milk to come with a hungry baby can be very distressing. And it can actually make women feel like this is something that cannot be done. So planning to breastfeed during the first hour of life is very important. Even if the mother has had a cesarean birth, hospitals that support breastfeeding actually organized so that within the first three hours that baby has actually breastfed. I, 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 I myself was able to breastfeed within that period even following a, a cesarean section but because it starts you off very well. So that is the other important thing that we need to note and I hope the video has made it very clear about how to latch on. It's one of the biggest challenges that women have. If you can get the latch on correctly your baby will get enough milk. You'll not have sore nipples and engorged nipples. The whole experience will be very nice. So if there's a technique that women really need to learn well, is how to latch on the baby very well. Okay, we can show you the video, but sometimes it may not just work out so naturally and so easily. What tends to happen often is that babies are nipple fed. And, and I keep reminding moms, it is called breastfeeding. If the baby latches on on the nipple, okay, the first time that happens, you might not feel pain or discomfort. It is something that will gradually come, like by day two or day three, because when the baby suckles on the nipple, damage happens slowly. And that's where the soreness comes in. But if a baby is latched on nicely from the beginning, um, breastfeeding should really be comfortable. So a lot of the soreness and the cracked nipples and the milk is not coming. It's because of uh, nipple feeding. So I hope the video has helped us see how far that nipple should go into that mouth. Actually, they say it should go almost to the back of the baby's throat. And if you were to pass your tongue down the, the roof of your mouth, you'll realize that the initial part is actually roughish and then it gets very smooth towards the throat. So we want that nipple to go to the smooth part, the safe zone, they call it. There, your nipple will not be damaged. So the baby's mouth should actually go on the darkened area around the nipple. That's where the feeding is. So it's called breastfeeding. 
So moms need, need to be encouraged to breastfeed and not nipple feed. When you breastfeed, the soreness and most of the issues that women have will be excluded. So I'm hoping the, the animation and the demonstration helps us with the latching on. And latching on is not, uh, it may take trying and learning. You know, we are doing a lot of learning the first week. So we just require patience and keep working on it until we get it. Don't give up because you no, know, that is the, there's nothing that replaces your milk. So it may just require some patience as we learn, working with the baby and the mother and asking for help until you get it right. Once the latching on is okay, the rest of the breastfeeding will just flow with no issues. Okay, so those are the, the two things that I really want to highlight feeding during the first hour of life and really the best technique that women need one that is very important is how to latch on or to put the baby very correctly on the breast. So I think we can take that short break and then when we come back, we'll start by finishing the remaining part of the video, if that's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lady Carol, for the, for the very informative session. I believe this, the short break, you're supposed to answer some Q and A, some questions. Is that yes. okay? Okay. Uh, I, I'd want to say, I think first and foremost, thank you very much for that. That is very informative. I'd say having already breastfed my children, I did exclusive breastfeeding. Now I actually get to see the benefits of what I did. I didn't know all the details as you've explained which I thank God that I actually went that way. Um, for the, I see for the first question, we will not, for the participants, we won't be able to answer, we won't answer all the questions at this time. We'll answer a few questions, then we'll answer some more questions later on after the second session. And for Lady Carol, I'd want to start with the first question being, is it any advice regarding inverted nipples? Yes, inverted nipples, yes. And um, often when women tell me their nipples are inverted, I want to see. Because I've had very many women who think their nipples are inverted, but they're actually okay. Women who have like a slightly smaller nipple, sometimes call their nipples inverted. So we have flat nipples. Flat nipples, there is no nipple at all. You can hear me, yeah? Yes, we can. Okay. Flat, with, with flat nipples, there is no nipple at all. Or sometimes there's like a dimple. It's almost like the, the nipple has gone in. Yeah, so it, it's nice for somebody to actually have a look at that nipple because when a woman just uh, believes her nipples are inverted or flat, that affects how she will breastfeed. She will automatically think this is going to be difficult because. So in my experience, I've worked with very many women who say their nipples are inverted, but they're actually okay. But if your nipples are inverted and they're inverted for real, um, you will see visible flatness. It will actually be flat. And when you try to touch it, you know sometimes when you touch the nipple, it erects. If yours is inverted or flat, that will not happen, and you might see a dimple. So I'm trying to uh, just uh, help us recognize an inverted or a flat nipple. If you can, um, if, 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 you, if you try to touch it and then it erects, it's most likely not a flat nipple. Um, it's not a flat nipple. So when it's flat, if it's actually flat and it's inverted, Okay, this is just something that women are born with. It's not like there's something you have done. Uh, what we do is try and help the nipple come out. So there are actually things that women can start uh, wearing on. Uh, breast shields that they can put on and work with it. There's even a rolling technique that women can start using to try and push that nipple out but these things that you do, you can only do them after 36 weeks of pregnancy. 
because manipulating your nipple can actually cause you to produce oxytocin, which is the hormone that causes the uterus to go into labor. That's the reason why we do not start preparing the nipples before the baby is ready. And it's generally after you've completed that six weeks. So there, there are some nipple things that women actually put on. You put your bra on top and you work with it for some time. That gadget helps push out that nipple. Or alternatively, you can use a pump before offering the breast. Pumps have suction. And as you're pumping that breast, the nipple comes out a little. And then as your baby latches on and breastfeed, just the breastfeeding by itself, it will keep elongating and getting better. So that's what you would do if it's inverted or flat. So you can do something before delivery, as long as it's after 36 weeks, or post delivery, you can use pumps. There are even some people who use syringes. They actually put a syringe there and try to pull the nipple out. So you can either do that or use a pump before you breastfeed, so that it comes out a little more. And then as the baby latches on it, then it elongates. Yeah, so that's, that's how I'll respond to that one. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope Eve, that has answered your question uh, fully. Uh, the next question would be, are there any specific foods or drinks that are best for milk production while you're breastfeeding? Yeah, you've had this one, uh, Guinness. And Guinness increases milk. Have you heard that one? I've had women asking me a lot about that in class. And so let me just start there. The thing in Guinness that people think increased milk is the brewer's yeast. But you see, if you're taking alcohol, you can't quite separate it from there. But yes, there are a few things that are thought to increase milk. There is no like nice scientific research that has been done. But there are things that you can do to increase milk. Naturally, milk increases when the supply is up, demand is up. So milk supply is based on supply demand. The more a baby empties a breast, the more the body will make more. You see, like if a mother skips a feed, so you're supposed to be breastfeeding your baby every three hours, and then you skip the next three hours. The next time you do, the production will actually go down a little. So milk supply naturally is supply demand supply. The more you breastfeed, the more the body makes. So that's the first thing. If I work with a mother who feels like she's not producing enough milk, we need to establish the demand. Once the demand is established, then the supply will be there. I've actually worked with mothers whose problem is they're producing too much milk. And often in those scenarios, these are women who started pumping early. Because now when you pump, pump every, every Every feeding you're pumping, whatever is left you're pumping, you're increasing demand. And when you increase demand, your brain is told you're underproducing. So your body produces more. So supply is really based on demand. But yes, there are things that women can use. They are, they are seeds. They come in as a seed or they come in as a tea. Uh, frequently, lactation managers will uh, tell you to go and look for fenugreek. I don't know whether people have heard of fenugreek or fennel, it's either a seed or it's packed as a, a tea. You just boil it and then drink the water. In like two to three days, you will see the improvement in your milk supply. So those are the two, in my experience, that I know we use mostly fenugreek and fennel, either as the seeds you boil in water and drink, or as a herbal tea. But I know in some communities like here in Luyaland, there are some bogas, traditional bogas that people use. There is no good scientific evidence there, but women will tell you from their experience that when they use this one we call Saka, it helps. And I know many communities have many things that they use. But uh, I know the ones that have some little work done on is fenugreek or fennel. Yes. Okay, but we're still on that question about if we can have enough milk. Uh, I, have a, I have a friend who gave birth to twins and they seem to think that they cannot do exclusive breastfeeding for yes. twins. Is yes. it possible? It is. It is supply and demand. And you know, I know I have not taken time. You see, when we started that video, do you remember the picture of the mom who came in first? She yes. had what? 
twins. If you remember, she had twins. Actually, even triplets, you can produce enough milk because it is supply demand. But you see, the problem is apparently breastfeeding is a very psychological process. They, there are two hormones. There are basically two hormones that are in charge of breastfeeding. There's one called prolactin. I alluded to it earlier. Prolactin manufactures the milk and puts the milk red there. Then we have another hormone called oxytocin. Oxytocin is the one that causes the muscles around where this milk has been stored to push out milk. It's the one that is responsible for what we call the letdown reflex. So it's very possible for the milk to be made. It's in the breast. And then it can't come out because oxytocin is not working very well. Now, oxytocin is called the hormone of love. And it's called the hormone of love because it's the hormone that is responsible during a sexual height. It's oxytocin. Oxytocin is the other hormone that, uh, why we have a lot of issues in labor is oxytocin. Because oxytocin is a happy hormone. When a mother does not feel safe, a mother does not feel convinced, a mother does not feel confident, oxytocin does not work with you. And that's the reason why we have issues. So if a mother is already thinking, you know our brains apparently respond to our attitudes and our emotions. If a mother is already thinking, I can't do this, your body will not work with you. Because some of these hormones, even like for example, this is oxytocin. Let me give you an example. You, you have breastfed. You're just in town. You've left your baby at home. And that is some distance away from you. You're in town, minding your own business. You have a small baby. Then suddenly you just think, oh, my baby, I'm missing my baby. And you start having loving thoughts about your babies. I, I wish I could ask you what normally happens. What normally happens, like even if you're far away from your baby and you have this loving thoughts, Milk actually comes out. It yeah. literally comes out. You could not be, so, so those are the thoughts. Because oxytocin actually responds to your attitudes. It responds to how confident and safe and loving you're feeling. So like for that mother, I would say she first needs to know it is supply demand and the body has the capacity to produce for things. And then increase the, the demand. If you increase the demand, the supply will go up, especially during the first three months. It's possible. So this is a woman who will feed, and whatever is left out after the feed, pump and keep. Then do the next. So the supply goes up, and then if the babies don't have enough, then she has her milk stored up as a backup. So it can be done. We just need to change our attitudes, increase the demand, and then our bodies will work with us. But of course, she needs to eat well, drink plenty. But really the key is to increase demand and just be positive. Okay, thank you, sir. I have I have very good advice for her when we meet next. <laughs> you can absolutely be able to do this. Thank you. I think for our last question for this session, uh, is it normal for an expectant mother to have clear discharge from the nipple at the seventh month of pregnancy? Yes, it's very normal. In fact, there are some women who actually wear breast pads because the body is very organized. By the time you're 28 weeks, the body knows there's a baby growing. You see, when you get pregnant, some women, the thing that makes them know they're pregnant is the breast. So nature is that a baby is coming. I need to start getting ready for this baby. By 28 weeks, colostrum is actually forming. It's already there, ready for the baby. And that is why in some women, it is a lot, it actually leaks. And those women will see like crusts on the nipple. Some women, it actually leaks out completely and they use pads. So the breasts are ready for the baby. If this baby comes any time from now, the baby will be able to survive and be fed. So yes, it happens any time from 36 weeks, 28 weeks, your breasts are active. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thank you, participants, for sending in the question. Please keep continue sending in the questions. As you can see, Lady Carol is very, very prepared for all your questions. I would like to hand over to Dr. Andriga for the next for the next session. Thank you so much, Lady Carol. I am honored to be a part of this uh, eminent team. <laughs> You're answering some questions that I don't have answers for. I thank God so much for that. 
Uh, without further ado, we're going to hand over to you, actually, Lady Karo again. I apologize, we kept you talking for so long for the second session. And this time we'll be we'll partner with uh, Agnes Makindu, who's ready to walk you through some of the questions that are going to come, or some of the questions you didn't answer this last time. Kara, are you ready for us again? I, uh, I wanted like uh, I wanted to complete the video, so you'll give me like five do, minutes. Oh, you so just, five minutes. Uh, okay. Give me like five minutes so that we can continue mm. from where we had reached. Let me put uh, Agnes Makindu on the spot. Agnes, uh, are you ready to take over? Hello, Dr. Ndwiga. Hi, Agnes. I am ready. Yes. I found this session to be very informative. I am not having any more babies, but... <laughs> yes, I am not having more babies. But um, I, I now have answers to young mothers uh, to new mothers where breastfeeding is concerned. So Carol, thank you so much. We, we appreciate uh, the information that's coming through. Carol, you may take over and um, continue with the video. As Carol gets ready, you're welcome to share some more of your questions. Don't hold back. They are being answered from a point of view of knowledge and experience. And as you can see, this is actually anointing. This is not just uh, book knowledge. I remember my wife uh, being offered uh, two Guinnesses uh, when she was leaving maternity by one of our workmates. I don't know how many also experienced the same.
Okay, we can continue from here until the end. Although new parents are urged to watch for hunger signals instead of scheduling feedings, there are some general guidelines to follow. Since breast milk is digested quickly, you want to need to feed about every one and a half to three hours, which means at least eight times in 24 hours. Remember, babies' feeding patterns vary, so some days they may look at your spectacle, even every 45 minutes or so. While on other days, it could be less often. You want to also need to feed at least one per night. A young baby is flying at an amazing rate and needs the extra nourishment provided by a night feeding. Also, if the new mother goes four or more hours without nursing, the breasts may feel uncomfortably full and she may need to breastfeed to get relief. <laughs> This image shows the inside of the breast. Breast milk is made in the milk making glands. The milk travels from these glands to the nipple through a series of ducts. You can see how milk pools in these ducts between feeders, and it can be easy to latch on and feed. There is a cycle that tells the milk making glands when to make milk. First, the mom feels the baby suck. Second, the message is sent to the mom's brain to tell the breasts to make milk. Third, the breasts get the message and produce milk. Consequently, the more a mother breastfeeds, the more milk she'll produce. Some mothers feel a sensation as their milk starts flowing to the baby. Moms may experience a menstrual cramp feeling, a pins and needles tingling feeling, and they may not notice anything. <laughs> It is not necessary to switch breasts halfway through a feeding. When you begin with each feeding, babies get thorn milk, which is full of nutrients and looks thin because it contains more water to satisfy thirst. As the baby feeds, this gradually changes to hind milk, which is richer. Hind milk is higher in calories, which are important for weight gain and satisfying hunger. It is important for babies to completely finish the first breast at each feeding, so they get all of the richer hind milk. So if a baby finishes one breast, she may feel completely satisfied and not want to take the second breast. But in the beginning, it is helpful to regularly use both breasts at each feeding to keep up a good milk supply and to relieve fullness. Because babies need this hind milk, newborns breastfeed for about 20 to 40 minutes at a time. As babies get older, they usually feed for shorter periods. <laughs> The use of pacifiers and artificial nipples should be avoided in the early weeks. Several research studies have suggested that pacifier use has been associated with slow weight gain, nipple confusion, ear infections, and early weaning. To learn the second motion from your own breast, and a pacifier can't give your baby the comfort and security of being held close to your breast. If breastfed babies must be given bottles, either of breast milk or supplemental formula, they can usually adapt and continue to breastfeed without any problems. However, bottles should not be introduced until breastfeeding is well established. If you breastfeed frequently, your baby should be gaining weight properly, but there are some general guidelines for determining healthy weight gain. Newborn babies may lose some weight the first three or four days as they shed extra fluids and pass their first stools. Most babies regain their birth weight within 10 to 14 days. For the first three to four months, typical weight gain is six to eight ounces each week, or at least one and a half to two pounds each month. From four to six months, a baby typically gains three to five ounces each week. Another encouraging sign that your baby is healthy and getting plenty of milk is dirty diapers. After three or four days, babies typically wet six to eight diapers each day. However, since wetness may be hard to see on some diapers, counting soiled diapers may be more reliable. Healthy babies have at least four good-sized bowel movements each day. These bowel movements may look yellowish and have a soft consistency like cottage cheese. After a few months, it's normal for a baby to have fewer bowel movements each day. If you're concerned about your baby's weight gain, don't hesitate to call your health care provider or a lactation consultant. It is their job to help make breastfeeding work for you and your baby. Thank you. Hmm. Daddy, my 
is it jumping, jumping? What have you done? There are periods when a baby will need to feed more. These are called growth spurts. Growth spurts generally occur at around two or three weeks, six weeks, three months, and six months. Again, it's important to watch your baby, not the calendar, to recognize these spurts. It's easy to take care of yourself when you breastfeed if you just follow your body's signals. Eat, drink, and rest as much as your body tells you to. You can even breastfeed when you're feeling under the weather. Just check with your doctor before taking any medications. And remember, everything that you take in as a breastfeeding mother gets passed on to your baby, including alcohol and cigarettes. So ask your healthcare provider about the risks associated with smoking and drinking alcohol during lactation. Also, ask your healthcare provider about the best methods of birth control available for breastfeeding women, because breastfeeding is not birth control. No matter what kind of birth a woman has, breastfeeding is the healthiest way to feed her new baby. Mothers who have cesarean births can breastfeed after delivery, usually within the first hour. In fact, the baby's sucking motion will promote uterine contraction and healing after surgery. There are certain breastfeeding positions, such as lying down on her side or the football hold, that are more comfortable for a mother while she is healing. Breastfeeding also provides many health advantages for preterm babies. Preterm breast milk is actually suited to meet the nutritional needs of preterm babies because it contains higher levels of many disease-fighting ingredients. If a preterm baby is too weak to suck, breast milk can be expressed with a pump and fed to her through a tube until she can feed at the breast. Even if a mother has to be away from her preterm baby, she can still pump at home to keep her milk supply going and to freeze breast milk for future use. Breastfeeding works for all kinds of families. Dad shouldn't feel left out with mom's breastfeeding. They can find their own ways to bond with baby. Babies like to be rocked, cuddled, sung to, taken on walks, and read to. All are great things for dads to do. And single moms who breastfeed can rely on the support of other family members, friends, and healthcare professionals as they get comfortable with breastfeeding. Mothers appreciate that breastfeeding allows them to easily feed their babies anywhere. Though new mothers may feel nervous about the thought of breastfeeding outside of the home, breastfeeding in public can be done discreetly so that no one can tell that they're actually nursing. Moms can go to a secluded spot, wear loose clothing, or cover up with a jacket or blanket. Breastfeeding can also work for moms who return to work through pumping breast milk, scheduling more flexible hours, or supplementing with formula. Breastfeeding is economical and convenient. It's a choice that can be adapted to any lifestyle. This program has given you the basic steps for successful breastfeeding. If you have questions or problems along the way, don't hesitate to ask for help. And before you know it, breastfeeding will be second nature for you and your baby. Okay. I'm 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 thinking uh, maybe Agnes, I can take a few questions from what we've just watched, or if you have another list, because um, I wanted us to talk about challenges and what to do about it. And I know some of the questions you have reflect the challenges that women have. And that will be very specific. So maybe I can take a few questions, either from what we have watched or from the questions that you have. Thank you, Carol. Um, I think that video has really brought out the importance of breastfeeding, the advantages, it being convenient, it being easy to feed the baby wherever you are without uh, having to do any much preparation. And we know that breastfeeding is actually best for baby and even the preterm babies uh, need to have yeah. uh, the mother's breast milk. 
Now, um, and then it has also brought out that breastfeeding is not a birth control. Uh, so for those who are thinking that you will use breastfeeding as birth control, please speak to your doctor before you use breastfeeding as a birth control. We don't have many questions at this point. Uh, we have one question, um, and uh, this goes out to say, when you are pregnant, can your hubby touch your breasts now that you said uh, some rubbing can activate the uterus? Perhaps you can answer that as we see if we'll receive more of the questions. Yeah, that is a very important question. Question Because, you know, we say pregnancy does not mean that your life should stop. Even when you're pregnant, unless your doctor has specifically told you abstain or whatever, life needs to go on. I would say not necessarily. Now, that question also answers the same question. Uh, is it okay to breastfeed when I am pregnant? It's really the same thing. And the answer is you can go on through the first trimester and through the second trimester, it's okay. Actually, most of the reasons that we don't do it is more cultural than scientific. Now, for most women, they can comfortably breastfeed. Your husband can comfortably touch your breast with no problem. Really, the risk is when your nipples are touched, your body produces oxytocin. The hormone I said causes the uterus to go into labor. Now, the uterus cannot go into labor during the first trimester or the second trimester naturally. When you get to the third trimester, then there's a hormonal shift that then makes the uterus respond to oxytocin. Uh, unless there's a problem, that should not happen during the first trimester or the second trimester. And the caution really is when we get to the third trimester, which begins from 28 weeks, when your nipples are touched or when your baby breastfeeds, then you will feel your uterus contracting. Contractions is what women feel when they go into labor. Myself, I actually breastfed Joy and Carla together. Uh, I think Joy was nine months when I conceived Carla. And I felt she was premature. I cannot stop right now. And I actually breastfed her even to some time during third trimester. And the only reason I stopped is that when I breastfed her during third trimester, then you would actually feel the uterus go into contractions. If your uterus does not go into contraction, it is okay. So really the caution is during the third trimester, not during the first and the second. Great, thank you, Carol. I, I believe that answers the question. For me, I actually thought you cannot breastfeed at all uh, if, you, if, if you are pregnant. So that, uh, that is wisdom right there. Thank you very much. Another question that we have received is what causes nursing strike? What causes nursing strike? Uh, nursing strike is just a baby refusing to feed. Um, many things can cause a baby to refuse to feed. Uh, a baby could be unwell. So a nursing strike is you, fe you have a breastfeeding baby who does not breastfeed, refuses. And uh, in teaching parents, we normally tell parents a baby who is not breastfeeding is not a well baby. So first, the baby could not, the baby may be unwell, and you may need your baby doctor to check that out to make sure that the baby does not have a problem that is making the baby not feed. But there are other things that could cause a baby to refuse to feed. We have birth injuries, that also contributes. We have some medications. So you can see your baby is breastfeeding well, then you're seen somewhere, you're given this drug, then once you start taking this drug, the baby refuses to breastfeed. Because remember, the video says that everything you take in as a breastfeeding mom comes through the breast. So there are times, there are medicines that we take that actually change the taste and the smell of milk. And that change makes some babies refuse to, to breastfeed. So medications, yes, things like staphylococcus. So you know babies find it difficult to breastfeed and babies only breathe through their noses. They don't know how to breathe through their mouths. That can also cause um, uh, uh, a baby to refuse to breastfeed. 
things like engorgement, also delayed feedings. There are very many reasons why a baby could stop breastfeed, can stop to breastfeed. Even sometimes just overstimulating your baby. You know, like uh, I know, like in our African societies, we get lots of visitors when babies are born. So a baby is touched like the whole day. There's just a specific amount of stimulation that the baby can take. You know, they are learning a lot of things. They're learning a lot of things. So, um, a baby might communicate to the mother that what I have encountered today is enough. And maybe the mother does not have a way of getting that information and just keeps going and keeps going because we are all celebrating this new life. Therefore, a baby can be overstimulated. And when a baby is overstimulated, a baby can refuse to feed. Also, some of the things that women feed on, you know, mother's diet, it can actually change the taste and the smell and can make a baby stop feeding. So sometimes it's good to like identify if it's, uh, the baby is not well, your baby doctor will be able to sort that out and advise you accordingly. If it is food or medicine, when you withdraw, then the baby just resumes feeding. But uh, really how we do it, we just recommend that you spend a lot of time with the baby. It's just a you and baby time, away from visitors and the rest of the world, doing a lot of skin to skin. Just give yourself 24 hours. You can wear your baby, do a lot of skin to skin with the baby, and then just encourage the baby to breastfeed again. So you just give yourself 24 hours of just spending time with the baby, doing a lot of skin to skin, interacting with the baby. The baby, after some time, will just resume breastfeeding unless there's some other problem that a doctor needs to fix. Thank you, Carol. Uh, at what point can a mother uh, start giving like uh, vitamin supplements, omega-3 or 7Cs? When, when can they start doing that? Do they get it through the milk throughout the breastfeeding period? Or should they start after six months or after nine months of breastfeeding? When can they do that? Well, uh, when a baby is uh, being exclusively breastfed, those omega-3s and omega-6, I, I did mention that they are there in the breast milk. In fact, the omega-3s and the omega-6 that are there in the in the breast milk are very essential. You see the omega threes and six that we find in cow's milk, it has some components in them that is not quite exactly like the ones you find in human milk. So the cow milk also has omega six and three, but it has some, some things in addition to what you'd find in the human milk. And so as long as a baby is still breastfeeding during the first year of life, it's not really necessary. All those things are in the breast milk. Unless a child is not breastfeeding, then that's a different story. But as long as a baby is breastfeeding, because even after you start weaning, you do not stop breastfeeding. We recommend that you continue breastfeeding way into mm. the second year of life. So as long as the baby is still breastfeeding, most of these things the baby gets. But if a baby goes off breastfeeding completely, then your doctor will guide you into supplements. But with breastfeeding, the baby gets everything they need. Great. Thank you for that. Carol, perhaps you could touch on the issue of um, uh, pumping, the breast pump. Yes. Uh, do you have a, a recommendation? Would you recommend an electric pump or a manual pump? Which one works better? Especially, uh, this is mainly for the first time mothers who've never gone through uh, pumping milk. Which one would you recommend? Um, all, 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 all pumping is okay. Um, of course, there are others which are more efficient, more convenient. But hand expressing is fine. With hand expressing, somebody really needs to teach you how to do it. Because it's not like uh, the most efficient way to hand express. It's not like the way we milk a cow. <laughs> There's a difference. But it mm. can be used. It's just that it is more tedious and it takes longer. 
but it can still be used. It depends with where a woman is. Then you can manually pump, or you can, of course, electric pumps are efficient, they are convenient, uh, but all is okay. It just depends with what a mother can afford and what she's comfortable doing. So I wouldn't say that uh, electric, not manual or hand, no, all the expressing is okay. But for manual, you need to be taught how to do it. There are very many machines that exist in the market right now. I don't want to speak for one brand, but I would say a good machine is one that allows the mother to change the vacuum. You know, there are some machines that are preset and there's nothing you can do about the pressure. So if it's too low, milk is not coming fast enough, there's nothing you can do. Others are preset higher, you're feeling pain and discomfort and there is nothing you can do. So a good press, breast pump, whether it's manual or electric, must have a knob where if you feel like this is uh, too uncomfortable, you can reduce. Or if you feel like I need more vacuum, you can increase. So as long as that button is in your control, that machine should be okay. Great, thank you. Um, ladies, there you have it. You know what to look out for when you're looking for a breast pump. Look for one that has uh, that, that the vacuum can be changed so that it's comfortable for you to pump milk and uh, you actually enjoy the process of breastfeeding. Thank you very I, I, much. We, uh, yes, sorry, Carol? now that we are talking about uh, expressing, maybe we can talk about storage. We can talk about storage of. Um, milk. Um, you know, I, I, I had taught classes for a very long time before I had my own baby and I kept telling people human milk does not go bad. So when I had my own human milk, I decided to test out this theory and I actually expressed some and I took just milk that would normally give a newborn and I put both of them on top of the fridge overnight. When uh, I smelled them in the morning, the human milk was completely smelling fresh, but the other milk has started going bad. So that is just the thing. It's nice for people to know that human milk does not go bad because it has like antibiotic, it has some components that preserve the freshness of the milk. And so after you have expressed just on the surface, it can actually stay for eight hours and longer in colder climates. In the fridge, just in the normal home fridge, we normally say three to five days because you know like at home you keep opening the fridge. But if your fridge were to stay shut, it can stay for a week. And it's just okay, it's fresh, it's nice. If you're freezing it, then it can stay in the freezer for six months. And it's good to go. So you see, because uh, of this ability that human milk has, we normally tell mom, you know, sometimes you may want a break. It's not that you have to, the baby has to feed from you all the time. What we want your baby to have is for your baby to have your milk. And so express, expressing your milk is a good opportunity for other family members to help feed the baby, but your baby will still get your milk. So you can express and keep it for now or for future. Like when you're planning to go to work, like working moms, you see like for many working moms, when they go back to work, there is a drop in milk production. Not because something happens at three months. No, it's because when they go back to work, the stress of work, you know, you have to be there on time. You're seated in meetings, you have deadlines, you know, you are under pressure. Oxytocin does not work very well with stress. And that's the reason why when women go back to work, the milk supply drops. It's not like at home where you're just relaxed and thinking about your baby, you're not under pressure. Oxytocin works better in that environment. So when you're planning to go back to work, you can even start like a month and a half early, a month, two. You express so that by the time you go to work, your freezer is full of milk. That way, you will not be under pressure. Oh, my baby doesn't have milk for tomorrow. What will I do? Because you have enough reserves. So it can be anything. One week, two, two weeks, two. You can pump and freeze. can stay there for six months. In fact, there are some sources that say it can actually go up to eight months. But generally, we use six months in the freezer is good. 
So like when you want to use it now, you remove from the freezer, you let it thaw in the fridge overnight, and then you can put it on the surface to completely thaw as, as you're getting ready to do the feed. Now, human milk is living. It's very alive. And that's the reason why we do not boil it, we do not microwave it, because then when you do, you kill it. And then just it becomes, just you're, you're feeling an empty tummy, and you destroy the aspects that make human milk unique. So how we warm it, you just uh, put it in hot water until it's lukewarm, and then you give the baby, but you do not boil it or microwave it, because human milk is very living. So that's how we would handle um, expressed breast milk. And once you have used it, you've poured it and you've used it, then whatever is left, you cannot rethaw it. You cannot refreeze it, sorry. So the recommendation really is for storage. I know like if you go on the Ashara Street, they have these small containers, usually 100 ml. Those are the storage, storage bottles. You can find like a dozen of them. Usually they don't have new forms. And they're like 50 to 100 ml. The reason why it's 50 to 100 is you want to make sure that it's an amount a baby can finish completely. Because you don't want to put it in 200 ml, then you throw the whole thing, warm it, and then your baby only is taking 50 at that particular time. Then that means you're wasting the rest of the milk. So when you store it in capacities of 50 and 100, then you use the milk up. You don't have to throw off some of that milk. And that way, expressing actually gives working moms the opportunity to breastfeed, not to breastfeed, for their babies to be given human milk, and even for other family members to help. Maybe mom just wants a break to lie down. Your baby can still be bottle fed, but bottle fed your milk. And uh, it, it brings me to a, a, a question here. I, I know in the video they said, people usually ask, what is the right time to introduce bottles? I don't know if there's anyone who has asked such a question, but um, it's a very common thing that mothers ask, what is the right time to introduce bottles? Now, the reason there is a time is because there's something called nipple confusion. And nipple confusion really is the reason why we do not want bottles to be introduced right from the beginning. I have worked with babies who have been nipple confused. It is difficult. Those babies will completely refuse that breast. And in fact, when they see some of them just scream and cry. Because you know, breastfeeding is hard. It's not easy for the baby. When they are very young, you will see, especially when they are newborns, if you're observant enough, you will see they will breastfeed, 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 take a pose. Breastfeed, 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 take a pose. In fact, some of them will go, <laughs> it's like it's really hard. They breastfeed a little, take a pose. So pulling milk out of the breast is not so easy. And it was nature's design to allow their mouth muscles to develop and become strong. Allow that jaw to develop and become strong. So that was intentional, but it is hard. Now, before babies have mastered breastfeeding well, and then you introduce bottles, now, from the bottles, milk just moves away. It is easy. They don't have to work as hard. And you know, babies are smart. They just realize, ah, there's an easier way to do this. And often when you introduce bottles too early, before they have mastered breastfeeding, then they prefer the easier way. And then they refuse the breast. That's why the recommendation usually is like at a month old, because the assumption is, by one month, they are breastfed, breastfed, they are used to this thing. Or if you can do it after two weeks, your baby must really be good at breastfeeding so that nipple confusion doesn't happen. Okay. Do you have any other question, uh, Agnes? Thank you, Carol. Um... We don't have a question from the chat, but maybe you can advise, is there a particular type of bottle nipple that uh, would work better for the child in the event that you have to use the bottles? Is there a particular type of nipple or shape or uh, size that uh, mothers can work with 
to uh, give baby the the best uh, bottle experience yeah they 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 have these labels there are so many um i think many of them are just labeled uh, designed to look like the breast it's not uh, straight up it's not straight up those labels are designed to look like the breast so uh, the idea is to make it um, not as easy and so we have baby friendly nipples they are available in the market if you go ask they are slightly different from the regular nipple the regular nipple just makes it just flow out easily so yes you can go and ask for nipples that help babies not get nipple confusion they are there wow thank you i think technology has advanced when i was breastfeeding my babies all the nipples <laughs> <laughs> all the nipples were the the ones that just make the mil the milk flow easily yes, ladies I, you've I, had it i used to have a uh, that nipple I'll, I'll i'll try and see if during the next session i have it maybe i will uh, i will show it but that nipple is slightly different from the from the from the from the regular ones and if 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 a mother wants help you know you can use bottles but also cup and spoon is an option mm -hmm. okay i i tried cup and spoon when when yes. my babies were younger yes. uh it was not it was not very easy but i found it uh, more hygienic than even using the bottle yeah it is it is uh it is uh there is a way you can actually cup feed your baby it's very easy you just put the cup at the end of the mouth and they just drink you see like the way we feed these newborns in uh, in in in, in nurseries for example they drink it very mm -hmm. quickly so i think it's just a technique that mothers need to be to, to learn be taught. yeah because mm -hmm. they discourage uh, bottles and nipples okay besides uh, the nipple confusion then the hygiene issue the okay. diarrhea and uh, stuff comes in yes yes that's true okay we don't have any other questions at this point ladies you've seen that uh, breast milk is indeed very precious so if you're opting to uh, express milk make sure you have the right capacity of containers so that you don't waste that precious liquid it's it's like gold for your baby so don't waste it make sure you get the right capacity of, of containers for storage uh, store your milk properly and remember no microwaving microwaving is a no-no and you can't boil it in the sephoria. Do not. So remember, get the hot water, put the milk in the hot water, let it warm slowly, and then you can feed your baby. Over to you, Carol. Um, I'm seeing like our time is up, so maybe we will just wrap up. Um, we have a continuation of this uh, next week, and there were so many questions that had been posted. And uh, I have been requested to go beyond just breastfeeding and answer some questions on pregnancy, labor, and delivery. And so next week, uh, we will do a lot of answering questions uh, because I have a long list of questions that had been sent earlier. So you can encourage uh, those who have registered and participants to send in questions beyond breastfeeding. Um, I know this year I wasn't able to come and do a childbirth uh, session and so I know there may be some pregnant people who are wondering about this or that pregnancy, labor, delivery. So those questions are also welcome. We will address them. I haven't chosen a specific topic to address, but I will prepare for some things just in case the questions will not cover the entire time that we have but we will do that we will just answer questions pregnancy labor delivery and any others that you may have on breastfeeding so these are some of the challenges that i had uh, put on the list we've talked about so nipples we've talked about inverted flat nipples um now engorgement engorgement is when the breast becomes too full 
and I know you saw the picture of inside the breast, so the breast pockets are too full. In fact, uh, an engorged breast, when you touch it, you can feel the pockets, they're full and they feel hard. An engorgement can be very uncomfortable. Often engorgement comes because we are not sufficiently emptying the breast. And um, now, if you're not sufficiently emptying the breast, then there's a risk of the ducts getting blocked and the process can end up with a breast infection because now you see the breast will become too full of milk and the milk will leak out of the breast gland into your blood. When it leaks out into your blood, then it causes an infection where you can have an abscess, you can see a red spot on the breast, you start getting fevers and chills, and then that needs to be treated. But just when gorged breast, empty your breast sufficiently. When they're full and uncomfortable, you can take a warm piece of cloth, just put on the breast and express some that will be able to relieve the discomfort. We also have uh, frozen cabbage leaves. I don't know whether you've heard of that one. You just freeze a cabbage leaf, you know, you just peel it, freeze it, and then you put it on your breast and put on a, a bra. That sorts and gorged nipples very well because the, the, the cold um, takes care of the pain and then the cabbage will release some enzymes that will really help relieve the engorgement. <clears throat> now thrush is just, uh, it's a fungal thing that can happen to both the baby and the mother. And the way the mother knows that she has thrush, when you're breastfeeding, you feel like some shooting pain through the breast. You know, shooting pain when the baby is breastfeeding. And then you could itch. Anytime you're itching, we suspect a fungus is involved here. And then uh, sometimes when you look into the baby's mouth, you see some white patches that are not milk. This ones of thrush look slightly different. So thrush can make uh, everything uncomfortable for both the baby and the mom. Uh, we just have some antifungal oral gels that can be used, and that will take care of uh, thrush. Uh, <coughs> and where thrush comes from, <coughs> it's a, uh, well, babies, just because they're premature and many other reasons can cause them to have, but thrush uh, comes, it's, 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 it's largely a hygiene thing. Like when you're using uh, breast pads, and you walk with uh, wet ones for a long time, that wet environment encourages fungus. So the staying with wet pads for a long time encourages fungus, that is one. And so we encourage moms, when you're using breast, pad, breast pads, do not stay with wet ones for a long time, change them when they're full, that will help. And then just general hygiene, like when you go change your pads, wash your hands, because we know we have a fungus that lives in us women, which can be transferred to the baby's mouth and cause thrush in the baby's mouth and then thrush on your breast. So it's just a hygiene thing. Wash your hands, change your pads. That minimizes the incidences of thrush happening. But in case it happens, you can just be treated. It's not that complicated. Now, the other issues I have put there and I think we will wind up here. It's just, uh, I don't know whether to call them challenges or they're just things I've heard about and I thought maybe it would be a good idea to talk about them. I have um, met moms who uh, choose not to breastfeed because they're afraid that their breasts will sag. Uh, uh, feeding in pub public has been addressed. And then there are also some who feel that breastfeeding is not for the modern woman. And I think these are very interesting challenges that maybe we will talk about them and prepare to talk about sagging breasts. Uh, it's not uh, for the modern woman to do. And I'll, I'll just preserve those sections so that we can cover them next week because I can see we are running out of time. And um, some of the Q and A's we've done, I guess we will uh, handle some of the other questions next week. And uh, I think with that, I will return to, I am done.
Thank you very much, Carol. What an informative session. I have learned so much. I can't wait for my grandchild to come along. Then I'll be able to coach my daughter in love. <laughs> Asante Sana. Uh, one, one, of the, one of the daddies in this group has just uh, shared that it, it's interesting that uh, babies are actually designed to, it, it's supposed to struggle a bit when they're breastfeeding so that it can build muscles. I, I, I also didn't know that. So this session has, it has really been an eye opener. Carol Asante Sana. Mm -hmm. And I'd want to turn over the meeting to Dr. Ndwiga. Daktari, are you here? Yes, I am, Lady, Car uh, Lady Agnes. Thank you so much. I have really enjoyed this. <laughs> I'm so glad you guys took it over and it has been wonderful. From a father to you as teachers and mentors, Asante Nisana. I know I'm speaking on behalf of everybody who attended. This was actually very, very useful. We have another session coming up next Saturday and Lady Carol will focus on answering your questions. Those nagging issues you've had or your friend has had, you can speak on behalf of a friend. People have actually struggled this year with regard to pregnancy, early pregnancy issues, late pregnancy issues, and also pregnancy, also breastfeeding and lactation. Please send those questions. What you've suggested is send them to us, either to members of the family, family mountain or the health nutrition team or the church Facebook site or the website site, send them as messages. We'll retrieve them and we'll prepare them and send them to Carol. Otherwise, we are so grateful for you. Our time is almost over. So at this point, I think I'll go ahead and pray, cover you with the blood of Jesus and declare the goodness of God over everyone and welcome you again on the 7th of November at 6 a.m. sharp. This time we'll not be late. We'll start at 6 a.m. Lady Cara, I know you are um, 6 a.m. 6, 6 p.m. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Lady Cara will be more, more ready more loaded and locked and loaded for us. And we appreciate that so much. I think we'd we'll want to see more men, isn't it? Or more ladies, yes. wouldn't it? Yes. <laughs> Lady Carlos, everyone. That's okay. So let's pray. Father, we appreciate your goodness and your grace. We appreciate your love. We receive from you wisdom for living. The wise man is cancelled. He doesn't walk in darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head. He sees the way he should go. Thank you for us as mothers and us as breastfeeding mothers for your instruction your wisdom, your direction, and your help. We bless you and thank you. Dedicate the church in your hands. Dedicate also the next meetings we're going to be having on 7th of November. And we thank you for your help and your grace inside those meetings. Thank you for Lady Carol. As she's poured out her wisdom, her instruction, her knowledge, and her life to us. Lord God, we just bless her in the name of Jesus. We say she's blessed. She has increased more and more, both her and her children. She's blessed of the Lord that made heaven and earth. She's blessed of the God of Israel. We bless her family and declare increase, financial increase her way this year because of her goodness and her favor towards us. We thank you and we bless you for these things. In the name of Jesus. Thank you so much, everyone, for showing up and we welcome you again on the 7th of November. Very good Amen. Time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Andrika.